The focus of today's lesson is to look at the need for compression and we're going to look at different uses of compression in today's society. You need to make sure that you still understand the difference between lossy and lossless compression. This is the same as what we covered at IGCSE, but uh, you probably will need to justify the method for a given situation. So what happens when you want to send an email, what type of compression should you be using uh, compared to whether you were in to send a file via USB. You need to show understanding of how text files, bitmap images, vector graphics, and sound files are compressed, and understand a compression technique which is called run length encoding. Okay, so let's begin. As usual, we're going to be going through some key terms first. Make sure that you pause the video and jot these down. Lossy and lossless file compression, these won't be too tricky for you. JPEG you've covered before, MP3 and MP4, again, are pretty straightforward file formats for audio and video, respectively. Next up is audio compression. That's again pretty straightforward. The new term you're going to be encountering now is called perceptual music shaping. So this is the method where sounds which are outside the normal range of hearing for humans are eliminated during compression. We're going to be looking at bit rate, which is similar to if you think about what we were covering before, amount of bits used for storing an image, perhaps 16-bit, 24-bit, the same can be applied in compression as well. And finally, run length encoding, which is a lossless file compression technique, normally used to reduce text and photo files in particular. So pause the video, jot these down. Okay, though video isn't part of the syllabus, I just thought to complete everything, it's useful for us to talk about video as well. And video works by playing a number of still frames at high speed to show motion, kind of like a flip book where you draw an image on each part, but when you flip through the book, through the motion, it looks like that the book is animated. That's exactly the same method video works. So you've got compressed photo frames which are played back at speeds, normally around 24 frames per second. This is known as motion JPEG or MPEG, and the current iteration is MP4. The camera takes the light up from the sensor and turns it into an electrical signal. Frame rate refers to the number of frames per second and you probably have read that about on games and all sorts of things. For example, movies, some movies are, you know, at 60 frames per second, others might be just 30 frames per second. Bit rate also applies to video as well, so the more bits we use, the better the quality and of course, the higher the file size. Do remember, this is not part of the syllabus, so don't worry too much about exploring this in any kind of depth. So let's move on to the main focus of the lesson, which is compression. To save storage space and for efficiency to reduce transmission time, we often need to reduce the size of a file. And this is where compression comes into play. From IGCSE, you should know this by now, that there are two main types, lossless compression and lossy compression. Both of these are applied to files to reduce their size an example is this particular image that is compressed using both lossless and lossy compression. You should be able to see this on your screen that the one that is compressed with lossy compression has a lot of blurriness artifacting going on. It's not quite clear. You can still make out what the image is and it's realistic, but it's not quite there yet compared to the one on the left, which is exactly how the original was. Now compression plays a big part, especially the type of compression you use as well. Of course, the one on the left is a higher file size than the one on the right. That perhaps also makes a great impact in the decision to choose what type of compression you're going to be using. So we're gonna look at lossless compression first. With this technique, all the data from the original file can be reconstructed uh, when the file is uncompressed again. Particularly useful for files where data loss could be disastrous, so you need to make sure that you know about examples such as financial data, academic records, medical data, and so on. There are algorithms like run length encoding, which are used to compress the file without losing any detail, especially things like text files, which, which can be quite important. Uh, we're going to look at this one in a bit more depth later on. Of course, there are other ones out there as well, uh, and maybe in your spare time, you might want to look those up as well and see how they work with lossless compression. Let's move on to lossy compression. With this particular technique, unnecessary data from the original file is eliminated. So when the file is reconstructed after decompression, it is not the same as the original. A common example would be images, 
audio and video formats like MP3 and JPEG. These are heavily compressed because we need to send them across the internet. The algorithms in a lossy format have to decide which parts of the file to keep and which parts to discard. Often a programmer will create these algorithms to focus on certain aspects like sounds that the human can't hear and those kind of things, but the algorithm in the end decides what to keep and what to reject. MPEG-3 and MPEG-4 are great examples of this. MP3 in particular uses audio compression technology to convert music and other sounds, and you're familiar with this one. MP4 works for multimedia, especially video. Now these can reduce file sizes by up to 90%. So an 80 megabyte file can be compressed to 8 MB. That's just phenomenal, the amount of compression that they can do. The quality perhaps is not the same as CD quality, but it is good enough for most purposes. And the reason it works so well is it uses a technique called perceptual music shaping. Now this particular technique is used to remove sounds that we as humans can't hear. For example, there are frequencies outside the human hearing range. We normally can't hear them. And sometimes you have two sounds which are played at the same time, like two instruments in a music track. And the louder one can often dominate the weaker one and it can be heard, the other one can't be heard. So in this perceptual music shaping, that softer one is actually removed. The quality isn't effective too much. However, since parts of the original file are removed, this is known as a lossy format. Depending on the bit rate, the quality of sound can change even in MP3. So if you've got an 80 kilobits per second MP3, it's often going to be sounding really, really poor. And if you go up in the bit rate and go up to 200 kilobits or even 320 kilobits, you're going to get close to CD quality music. Similarly, photographic images can also be compressed. When a file is compressed, both the quality and file size is reduced. It's exactly the same as you would do that for sound. JPEG is the most common compression format which is used around the world. So when a picture is subjected to JPEG compression, a new file is formed and the original image can no longer be constructed, so you can't go back to the original. JPEG reduces file size by a factor between 5 and 15, and that depends on the quality of the original as well. One might think that uh, vector images can't be compressed, but since they are in XML, which is text-based, we can even do compression on that. And for that, we use techniques such as run length encoding. Now, this is a very important area. You need to make sure that you understand this. This is a form of lossless compression that reduces the size of a string of adjacent identical data. On your screen, you see an original bit stream, which has a lot of repetition going on. And what we can do is we can identify those repeating strings and we can encode these into two values. One value, which is the number of the identical data in the run, hence the name run length encoding. And second is the code of the data item being repeated. It could be an ASCII code or a set of binary digits. Now run length encoding is only effective when there is a long run of repeated units or bits. If you see on screen there are a series of letters and it's very easy to code these because you can see that the letter A is being repeated eight times, B is repeated six times, and C is repeated two times. Fantastic, works really well. But what happens if they are not in a length or they're just randomly one after the other. You might end up with something which could be longer than the original because you're, you're taking two values for, for, for the same piece of data. And we'll, we'll look at how to go about solving that in a moment as well. Look at this particular string. It's not very straightforward. And in this case, the original 32 bits are encoded into 18 bytes. We can see that it can become a trick, bit tricky when you have CD, CD, CD being repeated. And the first few bits are pretty straightforward. In this particular case, we introduce a flag where if the data is going to be repeated, we identify it with a flag. 255 could be one such flag in our case. And if it's not, then we just leave it as it is. So if you're looking at our particular one, you know that the letter A is going to be repeated five times. So we simply put a flag in there and say 2550597. So this is going to be repeated five times. And we can do the same thing with B, where we can simply put a flag in and say this is going to be repeated four times. The ASCII code is 98. But when it comes to C and D, we don't necessarily need to do that because it will just extend the length of the run. So we just keep them as is. 9900, 9900, until we get to C, which is repeated again using the flag four times. 
This now gives us 15 bytes, which is an overall reduction of 53% from the original string of 32. So we can even get a huge amount more compression in run length encoding using a flag. Now the same technique can be applied to photographs as well. And here you can see a black and white image using RLE, which works the same way for ones and zeros. In, in this way, we can encode one for white and zero for black. The grid would be recorded and it would need 64 bytes if you were going to keep it as it is. But in the RLE format, we will only need 30 bytes. So if you can pause the video, you can look through this particular example and see how easy it is to compress even graphics by just looking at the individual pixels. And it doesn't matter whether you have color images, the same technique can be applied there as well. And even to a certain extent, you could perhaps use it for video as well if you really wanted to. Here's an example of color image compression using RLE. And again here, instead of kind of just doing zeros and ones for black and white, we use a color key. And you can create this color key for a number of different colors and then use this key to encode each particular pixel. In most cases, we'll just have RGB colors because all the others can be combined using those. So three bytes per pixel. So the above eight by eight image would need eight times eight times three, 192 bytes. The compressed image using RLE only takes 80 bytes. Do remember that due to the file header, real life reductions will often be smaller than compression. So sometimes when you calculate these things, putting on top of file header, putting in data about the kind of compression you're using, all of that also takes up space. So you might end up with smaller gains than the theoretical ones. Now finally, we're going to look at the methods of compressing without lossy and lossless. There are other ways for us to look at reducing file sizes and you can look at reducing the sampling rate for movies, reducing the sampling resolution, maybe reducing the frame rate. Those are also techniques where we can get away with file size reduction without the use of compression. And for images, we can crop it, we can decrease the color or bit depth, we can also reduce the resolution and that helps with reducing the size of an image as well without compression. And the same techniques can be applied to sound as well. Okay, that's the end of the lesson. Through this, you should now know how RLE works. You should be able to explain the difference between lossy and lossless, and you should be able to explain what perceptual music shaping is.